and I originally met Sue at a, at a launch party for her husband, Dan Barry, who was an astronaut. And uh, at that time I had been very interested in the experience of astronauts, uh, how they experienced null gravity and up and down and things like that. And um, I talked with Sue a little bit about this, um, but then we got on from Dan's way of seeing the world to Sue's way of seeing the world. And she told me that for the greater part of her life, um, she had effectively seen the world with one eye only, uh, that she had been, uh, that a strabismus, a squint, a cross-eyedness had been found when she was a few months old, that there had been various operations, uh, that things were cosmetically fine, but in fact she only made use of eyes alternately, one eye at a time. And um, I said to Sue, can you imagine what it's like to have binocular vision, to see stereoscopy? And she said, she said, I, I guess so. She said, I'm, I'm a professor of neurobiology. I've, I've read all the papers. I think I have insight into this. And I said, OK. And we left it there. And then there was an interval of nine years. And then I got a letter from Sue recalling this conversation and saying that when, I, when she said she could imagine stereoscopy, she said, I was wrong. She said, I can say I was wrong because now I have it. I have the real thing. And it is incomparable and unimaginable. And, um, uh, and no one can imagine it unless they've experienced it. And then her letter went on with very detailed lyrical descriptions of what it was like seeing a world stereoscopically. For her, this was a, a wonderful addition to her previous vision, although one which puzzled her because she understood, and the general understanding at the time was that unless one had developed stereo vision by the age of two, one couldn't develop it. The first thing I started to see were objects right in the center of my vision popping out at me, like sink faucets coming out or tree leaves coming out at me. And it was totally remarkable because I had never had that kind of perception before. It was something I could not have imagined. Sure, I knew the sink faucet was sticking out at me. I could feel it. There are monocular cues, cues you can use with one eye to tell. But this was completely different. This sense of palpable space, pockets of space between things, and objects occupying that space. It's, in the past, there were just objects. And now there was space and objects. It was a very different feeling. When I got this letter, my, my hair stood on end. Um, it was a, um, most of the letters I get from patients and people are, are letters describing the loss of some power, of some faculty, can I help them, their letters of lamentation, whereas there was this jubilant letter saying a wonderful thing has happened. And um, uh, I was very excited by it, but also puzzled and even a little suspicious, because I also um, was under the impression that one could not develop uh, such a power after the age of two. And uh, so I decided I would have to see for myself. Um, I gathered two good colleagues who had been with me on various visual adventures before, uh, Bob Wasserman, an ophthalmologist, and Ralph Siegel, a visual neuroscientist. And we gathered all sorts of stereo apparatus. Bob brought ophthalmoscopes. And we all drove up to Massachusetts uh, where where Sue was. And Oliver put a picture of a, um, from a, 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 a book of uh, sea creatures, and it was of a fish in 3D. And he put the book in front of me and he popped up the glasses that you use to see this. And I saw the picture right away and I got very excited. And I 
jumped up and down. I said, look at the fish. It's so, its mouth is coming out of me and all this stuff. And then I thought, what am I doing? I'm 51 years old and I'm acting like a child. And I sat back down and tried to regain my dignity. And I looked over at Oliver and he had this huge smile on his face. And that was very nice. 